Hi, so today we're going to take a little break from information processing theory and we're going to talk about approaches to instruction and this falls along with chapter 13 of your textbook, although I want you to note some ways in which my lecture is going to disagree with um, some of the things that are said in your textbook. So approaches to instruction, uh, let's see, what does the, okay. So we're gonna talk about objectives and then we'll talk about four different approaches, direct, cognitive approaches, humanist approaches, and social approaches. So objectives first. Um, so objectives versus goals. Um, educational goals um, tend to be set by educational leaders um, about what they'd like teachers to be accomplished and they tend to be fairly broad. Um, when I talk about instructional objectives, on the other hand, they tend to be very specific about a typical lesson rather than a unit, let's say, and they specify student behaviors. Um, they are measurable, they're observable, tend to be, um, you'll get a lot of instruction on how to write objectives when you start taking your methods classes um, from your, um, both your mentor teachers, your university supervisors, and your professors. Um, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, um, but I want you to know that there's some debate about the measurability of objectives and how measurable they need to be. Um, I'm going to say that um, I think that sometimes we get really caught up in the verbs and a lot of people will say, well, understand can't be an objective because it's not measurable. But I think you can measure understanding. I think that there are ways in which you can measure whether or not a student understands something. So I do think that you could say um, an objective could be something like students will understand the basic principles of photosynthesis. OK, so just a note. There. So let's talk about some taxonomies of objectives. So this is how we look at the level of complexity of objectives. Um, the first one we'll look at in the cognitive domain. So cognitive domain is um, the level of thinking. And this is going to go back to Benjamin Bloom. So if you've heard of Bloom's taxonomy, this is what we're talking about. Um, the first, the lowest level of the cognitive domain is knowledge comprehension. So this is just the basic recall of facts. Um, then we have application. This is the ability to take those facts and apply it to a new situation. And then we have what I call deep understanding and Bloom broke it down into analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. Um, I like to group those all together. I don't think that it's hierarchical between those three. I think that um, they can be interswapped um, for how deep the thinking is, just depending on what you're asking the students to do. So anytime you're asking students to analyze something um, or take it apart and put it back together. Um, synthesis means you're combining it with something new or coming up with a new idea. And evaluation, of course, means that you are critiquing it. And those th things are higher, require more cognitive input than something like application or knowledge and comprehension. The next domain would be the affective domain. And the first lowest level is receiving or attending to something. And then asking students to respond to that. Then asking students to value it. Then organization means um, incorporating it into their lives. And then characterization by a value or a value complex means that they've, they've made it an integral part of their life. So the affective domain is really how much they've incorporated that value into their own life. And then finally, we had the psychomotor domain. And that's the first, can they perceive that action? Then the set, can they, are they ready to do the action? Um, guided response is asking them to do it with your help. Then mechanism is um, getting them to do it. Um, a complex or overt response is asking them to build upon that. Adaptation is asking them to adapt that to a new situation. And origination is asking them to create their own. Okay, so once we have our objectives and we've thought about the taxonomy um, in any of those domains, but although really and truly teachers are usually most concerned with that cognitive domain, we're going to think about how do we align our objective and our instruction. So when we have clear objectives and we know what we want to teach, that leads us to clear instruction, which is really important. And our clear objectives also lead us to clear assessment if we can align what we want to teach to what we're teaching and then what we're teaching to what we're how we're assessing then it all works really nicely together and that's amazing yay so we want to align the content what we're teaching and then that taxonomy that level as well 
Um, and then a key component of that is who's creating that assessment. When it's you creating that assessment, it's very, it's a lot easier to make sure that everything's aligned. When it's someone else creating it, which is oftentimes the case, whether it's the district or the state, we need to make sure that our instruction and our objectives are then aligned to what the eventual assessment will be, which creates another level of complexity, perhaps. So effective objectives, um, make sure that the students are aware of those objectives. Um, that the students see them as directions for where they're learn for what they're learning. They're clearly written so that students and teachers can understand them. That the learning is just right. Think of that zone of proximal development um, if we're thinking about Vygotsky. Um, that um, improvement um, in intentional learning um, so that when we use objectives, we see an improvement in the learning that we're asking students to do. Sometimes we see that as a decline in that incidental learning that happens um, you know, by the fly or, or that happens um, naturally or organically in a classroom. Although when we have more general rather than specific objectives, we can sometimes see more of that incidental learning. Okay, so let's talk about direct instruction, um, which can be linked to behaviorism. Um, so the first thing is what is direct instruction? Um, it's when the teacher is making instructional decisions um, and the teacher is the one primarily in charge of making those instructional decisions. Um, but the students are academically are actively engaged in learning. Um, the lessons include a demonstration, practice, and feedback. Um, there's a productive and pleasant classroom environment. Um, and it includes this gradual release of responsibility that we'll talk about. The book seems to pretty be pretty down on direct instruction. It doesn't particularly like it. However, I'm going to point out that it's um, been used for centuries and that um, we really do have a lot of um, evidence that it's effective. And I think that there is absolutely a time and place for it and that it's, you, it's oftentimes the most efficient way of getting information across to students. So I don't want you to throw out direct instruction, although it definitely has its downfalls. Um, so some of the components. So the first is orientation. That's making sure students know what you're going to teach, the introduction of objectives, making sure students are, are engaged. Then you have the presentation. So you're giving students the information they need and engaging them. Then there's structured guided independent practice. So this is where the students have a chance to practice what you taught them then you provide them feedback on their practice. Um, this is closely tied to something called the lesson plan cycle um, that you'll become more familiar with in your methods classes. Um, this is really the basis of what a lot of teachers will show you in a classroom. This, is, you, this should be very familiar to how you think you've been instructed in schools. Um, so effective practice, what makes effective practice? Um, and this is um, what schools are now calling what we call gradual release of responsibility, um, which means that you start off with, um, it's like I do, you do, we do. The idea that you start off by showing them, then you practice with the group um, and you are working with them and then the students do it by themselves so that there's this gradual release where the students are eventually working independently, but you're giving them lots of scaffolding along the way. There should be short, intense periods of practice rather than long periods of practice. This is usually more effective. Um, you're constantly monitoring for accuracy and providing feedback to students so that they're not learning misunderstandings. That's key to this, that they're getting feedback. Um, that you're cycling skills over the years, that you're not just moving on, but you're coming back to those skills over and over again in the year so that, that they're not forgotten. So um, that's what makes effective direct instruction, that you're also giving that students a chance to be engaged. And I think there's a reason why direct instruction has been around for so long, um, because I think that it is effective, and I think that we do use it in schools because it is effective. However, I think it can also be done very poorly, and you've probably been in classes like that. So I don't think you should throw the baby out with the bathwater and never use direct instruction, but I also want you to be open to other means of instruction. Okay, so the cognitive approaches, which will include um, information processing theory, social cognitive theory, and also constructivist approaches. So the nature of IPT, or um, information processing and social cognitive theory approaches. Um, you communicate clear goals and objectives. This is clear. So at the very beginning, they know what they're going to be learning and they can attend to those things, right? Think about IPT. Um, you're using attention-giving devices. You're, you're cluing students into what they need to learn. 
Um, you're emphasizing organization and meaningfulness. You're connecting it back to the things that they know are important. Um, you're, pre you're presenting learnable amounts of information over a realistic time period. So you're making sure that you're, you're paying attention to what students could learn in a period of time, what their working memories can hold, and how they're encoding that into long-term memory. Um, you're facilitating that encoding. You're using those chunking strategies. Um, you're, you're helping them do that dual processing where you're tying visual to audio, right? All of those things. Um, if you're going to switch in, we're talking about constructivist approaches, which also tie into cognitive approaches. Um, you're providing that scaffolded instruction, so you're, um, you're giving them that support. You're using that zone of proximal development. You're thinking about what they could learn um, at their, if they're given um, that ideal just right learning. And you're providing opportunities for learning by discovery. So you can see in the picture there, right, that um, they're learning through exploration. And you're fostering multiple viewpoints. So you're allowing students to think about things from lots of different angles. Um, and you're allowing that discussion to happen. You're allowing different schema to be developed. You're emphasizing relevant problems and tasks. So you're connecting it to what they already know and what's meaningful to them. And you're encouraging autonomous learning. That means you're encouraging students to learn on their own and you're developing those skills so that they can. Okay, so some key elements for the learning environments. You have exploratory environments, ex environments where students are allowed to um, explore on their own and go into different areas to, to learn. Um, you're providing um, areas for guided learning where you're giving them ways and steps in which to do that, um, but on their own with your guidance. You're providing problem-based learning, so they're working to solve a problem that's relevant and meaningful to them. And you're giving them situated learning, so you're creating an environment that is set up to help them learn. Think about a Montessori classroom where um, all of the centers are structured so that they are meeting objectives and students are exploring on their own. Okay, the humanist approach, which is very student-centered. So the pioneers of student approach were Maslow, as you can see on the top, and Rogers on the bottom, and also Arthur Combs really pioneered this approach. Um, it's centered around the idea that people want to be self-actualized. They have a desire to learn and to become competent in the area that you're thinking about. Um, and it only occurs when basic needs are met. So we have to meet our people's basic needs first. We understand behavior through how the students see themselves and through understanding their context. So understanding their, their social situation, their lives. Um, and learning is meaningful to the student when it relates to their own lives. And it's effective when a student feels that a teacher accepts them for who they are. So those are the principles of hum the humanistic approach. So the teaching orientation, our primary goal is to understand students' needs, values, motives, and self-perceptions to help students learn. So our primary goal is to understand the student first, and that will help them to learn. Um, we're going to express genuine interest in the student um, and value the contribution of every student to our classroom. We don't tell the students what to do, but we guide them towards appropriate action. So we're really thinking about that caring environment. Um, this is really different than thinking about that direct teaching approach, right? I'm a humanistic model. Um, we're going to define the helping model first. Um, we're going to explore the problem. So what's going on? So if I'm going to use a humanistic approach, I'm going to explore the problem with the student. Um, I'm going to help them develop insight into what might be happening that's causing the problem. I'm going to help the student plan and make a decision about what we could do to change. And then we're going to integrate that into the, into the current situation. All of this is predicated on the fact that the student trusts me as a teacher and trusts that I have their best interests at heart. So um, all of this is based upon that theory and the idea that the student already, the student and I already have a relationship of trust. Um, Nodding's happy classroom. She did a lot with this, um, with this idea of the humanist approach. She believes that a classroom satisfies the physical needs of the child. It's clean and well-maintained, well-lit, physically safe. Learning is exciting, pleasurable, and meaningful to students. There's an opportunity to learn through play, and we think about that in early childhood, but play should go all the way up through adulthood. Um, we're avoiding sarcasm, humiliation, and fear in the classroom. 
we're capitalizing on student interest, we're fostering the intellectual growth of each student individually, we're fostering character development in our classroom, not just intellectual development as well. So all of those things come together for a happy classroom based upon humanistic approaches. Um, and we're fostering interpersonal growth, that is our ability to um, interrelate with others. So it sounds a little soft, a little wishy-washy, is this really effective? And the answer is really yes. Um, it increases motivation, a strong sense of competence, heightened autonomy for students, a st stronger sense of identity, better behavior, and ultimately higher achievement for students, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of studies that show that adopting this approach really does lead to better achievement for students. So yeah, this is a good thing. Um, and finally, we'll talk about this social approach and learning from each other. And then this is one of those areas where I want you to pay attention to what I say and less attention to what the book says, okay? So elements of cooperative learning, um, the group makeup. Now again, the book is really big on heterogeneous grouping. And you know how I feel about this, right? That um, I do not believe that heterogeneous grouping is effective for cooperative learning. And in fact, the research on cooperative learning took out the top 10 and the bottom 10% of learners when they made up these groups. So I do not think that you should put your top learner with your bottom learner in order to have effective cooperative learning, because I believe that that just makes the bottom learner dependent upon the top learner to um, do the work. Instead, I do believe that homogeneous grouping works best for cooperative learning. I think that you should group your learners together, or at the very least, group your middle ones, the ones who just learned, with the, learn the ones who are still struggling to learn that, that material. Be very careful with your groups. I think it is helpful to group leaders with, um, to group all your leaders together and all of your followers together to, to make them learn those skills. Um, so just be thinking about that. Um, I also think that sometimes thinking about the gender dynamics of your classroom, that sometimes it's helpful to put all the boys and all the girls in separate groups because sometimes the boys tend to override the girls. Um, to have group goals and positive interdependence. So making sure that the group has a specified goal and that each person within the group has their own role to play to promote that interaction so that everyone's responsible for a specific task so that no one um, is able to just kind of slide by with that individual accountability. Um, that we're developing those interpersonal skills so that if students don't have interpersonal skills and those need to be developed, you have to explicitly develop those skills within cooperative learning for it to work. Um, and that every group has an equal opportunity for success. Now, the book says that happens through making sure that the groups are equally distributed by ability. Another way you can do this is by differ differentiating the assignments so that everyone has an equal opportunity for success. You can give, um, you can differentiate the difficulty or the challenge level of each assignment so that um, you are tailoring the work or the detail required um, for each group according to their zone of proximal development. Then um, the book also recommends competition between teams to promote unity. Again, I'm just not a big fan of competition. I don't, I don't know that that would be helpful in the classroom. You're going to have to decide and know your kids and know how they're motivated in order to know if introducing competition would be helpful or not. So is cooperative learning effective? It has tons of motivational effects. And I think that you guys know this too, that, that oftentimes when we work with others, um, we're motivated to, to interact. We are social creatures and we enjoy that time to work with others and bounce off ideas with each other. We, we enjoy that, it's motivational. It's also motivational because we're, we have a bit of peer pressure and social pressure to, to, um, to learn from each other, to not let our groups down. And there's a cognitive developmental set in that we have now a model for each other so that we, from that social cognitive theory perspective, we are, we have a model, we have someone that we can, um, we can model from, we have someone to learn from. We also have an elaboration effect that we get ideas from each other and we can build upon our ideas, that idea that um, two heads are better than one, that we get ideas from each other when we build upon them and that brainstorming effect can be really powerful. So um, we do think that uh, cooperative learning can be helpful. Um, the social constructivist network um, through computer-based networking is another strategy that even in an online environment, um, we can use these skills to build social and cooperative learning, and this collaborative learning can be effective. 
So that was a brief overview of four different approaches to learning um, and how they tie into some of the learning theories that we've gone over this semester so far. So be thinking about how that might integrate and which ones you think you could incorporate into your own personal teaching philosophy and how you think that students learn the best. So again, if you have any questions about this or anything else, feel free to shoot me an email, give me a call, and I'll be happy to talk to you. Have a great day. Bye.